we're very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Richard Becker. Richard Becker is a writer and commentator on Middle East affairs. He is the Western Regional Coordinator of the Answer Coalition, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. He has visited the Middle East on numerous occasions. In January 2000, he was co-leader of the Iraq Sanctions Challenge, which delivered $2 million of medicine to Iraq. He led fact-finding delegations to Palestine in 2000 and 2002. And he is co-author of the book, The Children Are Dying, and is author of the new book, Palestine, Israel, and the U.S. Empire. Start out and tell us, what was the motivation in writing your new book, Palestine, Israel, and the U.S. Empire? Well, I've been involved in the issue probably for more than three decades. And uh, lately, recent years, I've spoken a lot about it <clears throat> and about related issues like what's going on in Iraq, the, the overall situation in the Middle East. But when I spoke about Palestine and Israel, one of the things that people have asked is, what's a good starting point? What's a book that you can read that's an overview? And while there are actually hundreds, thousands of books that have been written about uh, this subject, it was hard to come up with one that was, you could just say, that people who are you know, not uh, interested in the issue or involved in the issue in some way but don't know a great deal about it, what's a good starting book? And that's what I attempted to write, something that's straightforward, um, gives a well-documented history of what's happened over the last century or so, which is uh, the period in which this whole situation has evolved, has a chronology in it, has maps. Maps are very important. Uh, so it's really uh, designed uh, for, I think, kind of two intersecting audiences. One is the people, as I say, who are interested but don't know a great deal about it. And the other thing, uh, the other uh, purpose we really wrote it for was uh, to be a handbook, kind of, a, as a, a, a tool for activists. So talk a bit about uh, one of the things your book does is breaks, uh, shatters a lot of myths that we have developed via our corporate media system here in the U.S. Talk about the myth that a lot of people have the impression that the conflict in the Middle East has been going on for thousands of years. Yeah, I, I actually start the book. I, I think that's a, a, a central myth that has been drummed into the, the minds of people in this country uh, over and over again, relentlessly. Uh, and uh, I s start the book by citing a joke that George Mitchell, who is the former U.S. Senator from Maine, and in the 1990s, Mitchell was the U.S. Uh, negotiator in Northern Ireland, where, as they say, the conflict's been going on for 800 years. So when Mitchell is introduced at the State Department on January 22nd, 2009, by President Obama, he told a quote-unquote joke to the, all the assembled people. And the joke was that he had been in Jerusalem, he had mentioned the 800 years, referring to Ireland, and he said an elderly gentleman came up to me and said, did you say 800 years? And Mitchell said, yeah, I said 800. And the elderly gentleman says, oh, such a recent argument, no wonder you settled it. And all the people there laughed knowingly because they all, quote unquote, know that, as you said, this conflict's been going on not for 800 years, but for thousands of years and back to the beginning of time. And uh, the only problem with that so-called fact is that it's completely false. It's completely untrue. Uh, the idea that there's been this Arab-Israeli or Muslim-Jewish conflict going on for hundreds or thousands of years uh, is what is used to try to explain to people or convince people that it's an irreconcilable conflict that can never be solved and because of this age-old uh, supposed hatred. And the reality is uh, uh, that I, I submit in the book is that this is really, the present situation is really an an outgrowth and a product of Western colonialism. And that the real conflict in the Middle East today is between, on the one side, uh, the, uh, the United States, uh, Israel, and <clears throat> the dependent Arab regimes, uh, like in Egypt and Jordan and Saudi Arabia, that are aligned with the United States uh, and with U.S. policy in the region. And on the other side are the people of the region who want what all people want, which is justice and liberation and the right to have a decent life. So talk about some of the, the key uh, decisions and or um, agreements that shaped the Middle East today, maybe starting with the, um, the Congress of Berlin in 1884. Well, the Congress of Berlin in 1884 was a meeting of the European empires, uh, and virtually all of Europe at the time was divided into empires. Uh, they, uh, and at the Congress of Berlin, they finished dividing up uh, Africa. 
Up until that time, Africa was mostly colonized around the edges, the coastal regions, but now they sat together and they drew lines on the map with no regard for where those lines went and what peoples they divided or what peoples that they threw together. Many of the problems of Africa down to today are a product of that, that colonial division. <clears throat> well, 30 years after that, having finished dividing up the world among themselves, the empires went to war in World War I, which could, it was really a war of empires. World War I was a, an unbelievable carnage. On the average day in World War I, which lasted over 1,500 days, 6,000 people were killed. And most of them were killed in battle. Uh, that's more than all the U.S. Uh, casualties, in, combat casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Well, what were they, and what were they fighting about? Well, they were fighting, uh, as I said, to redivide the world, having divided it up. Uh, the British tried to enlist the Arab people, who were still under the domination of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, to fight alongside them, making a promise to them that if they would fight with the British against the Ottoman Empire, then when the war was over, they would support uh, an independent Arab state. In what would have uh, been uh, Syria, but a Syria much larger than the one we know today. Syria at the time, natural Syria, included Palestine, Lebanon, uh, a part of Jordan, as well as the present-day country of Syria. But at the same time, the British and French were meeting secretly and talking about how once they'd won the war, they would divide the Middle East, which they proceeded to do uh, in defiance of the wishes of the Arab people. And France took over Lebanon and Syria, and the British took over Palestine, Jordan, and Iraq. And not only did, the, did, did the, uh, that take place, but the British promised in the infamous Balfour Declaration in 1917 uh, that they would uh, support the establishment of a national home for Jewish people in Palestine once they had taken over the area. And uh, this was meeting the demands of the uh, then nascent young Zionist movement uh, in Europe, which uh, was fixed on finding a place to establish uh, an exclusive Jewish state. Uh, I have to say this, that the, the Zionist movement arose as a response to anti-Semitism, to anti-Jewish racism in Europe. But, uh, and so it was one reaction, it was a minority reaction among the Jewish communities in Europe up until the time of World War II. But at this, it was also a consciously colonial movement and a Euro supremacist movement. So that's a kind of contradiction that existed there. It was a reaction to one form of racism, but it embodied in it. And, and it wasn't unique in this regard because all of the settler movements that emanated from Europe, whether they went to Australia or Algeria or uh, the United States, what became the United States of America, all shared a Euro supremacist view and a disdain for the rights of the indigenous people wherever they were projecting their settlement. And did they all basically have the idea that the places, or present the idea that the places they were settling had no populations there? <clears throat> well, it's very interesting because uh, in 1897, and this is not, of course, thousands of years ago, 1897 really marks the beginning of the organized Zionist movement. It was the first World Zionist Congress. It was held in Switzerland. They had a debate at the Congress, the delegates who came, uh, whether they wanted to try to establish their state, at, perhaps in Uganda, which is in British, uh, was British-controlled East Africa, maybe in Argentina, which was technically independent, but really part of the British Empire. They were leaning toward Palestine. They knew nothing about Palestine. They sent off a delegation of two rabbis, uh, and the rabbis uh, telegraphed back a, a message that was very cryptic, and it said, the bride is indeed beautiful, but she's married to another man, meaning that Palestine is a beautiful area, but someone else lives there. That did not deter the Zionist movement. Uh, and I, I think because of that Euro supremacist view, but perhaps what, the, uh, what would become known as uh, kind of the foundational myth of the Zionist movement in the state of Israel, that Palestine was a land without people for a people without a land, perhaps what they were really saying was that uh, Palestine was a land without Europeans. And that was, they, as I say, they shared that outlook uh, with all of the other settler movements. And whether they uh, knew that people were where they were going or not, they did not regard them as worthy, the indigenous people, as worthy of respect or th uh, that they had rights that the settlers had to take into account. Talk a bit about the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Well, the Sykes-Picot Agreement was a secret treaty that was negotiated between 
the foreign ministries of the British, French, and then Russian empires, who were, they were allied together in uh, World War I. Um, and they uh, met in secret, and they talked about how once they had triumphed in World War I, they would divide up the Middle East. So the Sykes-Picot Treaty uh, was uh, in, in 1916, and the following year was the Balfour Declaration, where the British said that they would support the establishment of uh, the, the national home, what would become the state of Israel in Palestine. Uh, the Balfour Declaration, interestingly, was on November 2nd, 1917, and five days later there was a revolution in Russia. And the new revolutionary government in Russia is one of its first acts, its foreign minister, its new uh, uh, foreign affairs department published all the secret treaties that the Tsar's government had signed on to, including the Sykes-Picot Treaty. So in the months of November and December of 1917, uh, the, uh, the Arab leaders who had believed the British promise, fight with us and we'll support, fight on our side against the Turkish Empire and we'll support your right to an independent state, they find out, number one, uh, that uh, th that was a, a hollow and false promise, and that really the British and French intend to divide the area among themselves. And number two, that in the heart of the area of what they considered to be, would be their new state, which would have been Syria, uh, a, a, a central part of the region is being promised to a European settler movement. So they've not just been betrayed, they've been doubly betrayed, and uh, nevertheless, when the war ended, after the war ended, and this is interesting because it's how the Middle East might have been very different than it is today. Uh, there was a meeting in Damascus, Syria, and it was the, the delegates came from all of that area of what was natural or greater Syria. Uh, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, and present-day Syria met together in the General Syrian Congress and declared a new state called Syria, a constitutional monarchy. Uh, a year later, the British and French moved in with their armies and, uh, and, and crushed uh, the hopes for this new state. Uh, in Beirut and in Damascus today, you can visit the, uh, the martyr squares in both cities. Uh, and they're called that because that's where the French hung people who resisted the takeover. In Iraq, uh, that was really the beginning of Iraq as a modern country. In 1920, 10,000 Iraqis were killed, 2,000 British troops were killed, including the commanding general of the British forces meaning that it was very, very fierce resistance in Iraq to the British takeover. There were rebellions in Palestine as well. And over the next uh, decades, there was almost continuous rebellion uh, and fighting that was going on uh, against the British and French domination of uh, their takeover of this area. And that's interesting, I think, also from the point of view of, of you know, if we remember back, yesterday was the seventh anniversary of the fall of Baghdad and really the end of Iraq's independence. And at that time, uh, people like uh, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, uh, Rumsfeld's deputy, were all saying things in the media like, the, the, the U.S. soldiers will be welcomed by the people of Iraq and they'll be throwing flowers and chocolate at them. And anyone who would say such a thing uh, is either completely ignorant, and I doubt they were that completely ignorant, of the history of Iraq, maybe they were, but then not understand the history of, uh, of resistance to occupation, the foreign occupation in this uh, region, really opened the door for you know, the, all the, the carnage that we've seen in Iraq since then. But if you understood the history of the region, uh, you probably might have been able to guess that that's what was coming. So when did the U.S. become involved in uh, Middle East <clears throat> affairs. Well, it's very interesting that um, the the origin, say, of um, U.S. Uh, involvement in the region is uh, also, I believe, deliberately shrouded in uh, in myth or just completely ignored altogether. Um, the United States had no in World War One, 1914 to 1918. The United States had come in late, had no troops in the Middle East at all. But as part of its price for having come in in the support of the British and French who were quite exhausted, three years of war had, nearly three years of war had gone on, uh, the United States demanded that when the war was over they should re receive economic and political considerations. Well, there was a dispute in the, uh, in the aftermath of the war. Originally, in the French sphere of influence, according to the Sykes-Picot Treaty, was to include the northern province of Iraq, which was Mosul province. Now, Mosul province was the only area of Iraq that was known to have oil at that time. 
But the British, even though they were working together with the, fr with the French in that inter-imperialist rivalry, were also stabbing them in the back. So they moved their troops into northern Iraq and stayed. But the deal that they worked out, and it took years to, make the, to finalize this deal, was that, okay, <clears throat> they agreed the British could keep the northern province of Iraq, but the oil of Iraq would be divided five ways. And uh, the five ways were that the British, French, Dutch, and U.S. oil companies would each get a 23.75% share of Iraq's oil. The, uh, and 5% went to the guy who brokered this deal, Kalus Gulbankian, who is an Armenian oil baron known in history as Mr. Five Percenter. He had more than one 5% deal like this. So if you add all those up, what you get is 100%, meaning that the way that the United States got involved, and first began involved in Iraq, and, and in many ways in this whole part of the world, was by gaining uh, a tw uh, nearly quarter share of Iraq's oil, supposedly in perpetuity. And Iraq, of course, had 0% of Iraq's oil. Uh, and so from 1920 up until the revolution of 1958, uh, that stood. U.S. oil companies had uh, a near quarter share of Iraq's oil. Iraq, as a result, was an extremely impoverished country. The United States really became much more heavily involved in the aftermath of World War II. That's when the decisions were made in the last couple of years of World War II uh, that uh, the, while the U.S. closest ally was Britain, that very clear documented, uh, very well documented that the United States was, uh, was uh, striving to displace the British Empire in the Middle East, and particularly in the areas that they knew at the time, and they didn't know about all of it yet, but the areas that had oil. So Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia. In, while the war was raging, uh, the U.S. government was taking energetic steps. It sent out a, a memo was sent to all the U.S. embassies in the world in 1944, six months before the Normandy invasion. They not even, haven't even landed in Europe yet directing all U.S. embassies in the world to take all possible steps to assist U.S. petroleum companies in gaining concessions in those areas. And, of course, the Middle East, they were just beginning to know, but was very oil-rich. So the reason, and I believe that the reason that this history must be shrouded and must be hidden from the people in this country, above all, is that it answers the question, how did the United States first get involved in Iraq? Well, it was getting cut in on the oil. In, in other words, it's always been about the oil. It's always been about the resources. It's always been about the markets, and it's always been about domination. So all the ideas, all the, the, the propaganda that was handed out, like in the, in the run-up to the Iraq War and afterwards about human rights and weapons of mass destruction and all of this, all that was just a cover for what has been the fixed objectives of U.S. policy from the very beginning of U.S. involvement in the region, and that is control of those resources and control of the strategic positions as part of a strategy of global domination, which has been the real aim of U.S. foreign policy since World War II. And has U.S. foreign policy always been supportive of the creation of the State of Israel? Well, that's very interesting because uh, the uh, in the aftermath of World War II, uh, most of the Jewish survivors of the Nazi Holocaust, of the, this horrific mass murder that took place in, in Europe, uh, there were probably about 400,000 survivors, and most of them, overwhelmingly, 90%, wanted to come to the United States, the ones who wanted to leave Europe. Uh, the United States did not want them. Uh, and uh, the United States could have easily absorbed uh, the United States was the only country that came out of World War II much better off economically than it went in, and it was suffering virtually no damage, no damage at all in the mainland. The reason that the United States did not want to admit them, the Truman administration, was because they were moving in a different direction. They were moving into what would become known as McCarthyism, the witch hunt, the anti-communist and anti-left purges, and they viewed the Jewish survivors in Europe as being uh, overwhelmingly or very disproportionately, at least, uh, a, a leftist, socialist, communist, radicalized by this horrible experience that they had gone through as, and seeing the, you know, the outgrowth of capitalism and imperialism and a kind of war that had never been seen before. So that was a major motivation for uh, the U.S. government in wanting to direct them to go somewhere else, and that somewhere else um, became... Palestine, so there was a, a funneling of the population in that direction. Once the war broke out, which happened immediately after the United Nations partition of the 
British colony of Palestine at the end of 1947, where despite the fact that the Zionists uh, the, uh, owned only about 6% of the land, they were awarded 55% of Palestine uh, by the United Nations. That vote took place because the United States weighed in. It had to get a two-thirds vote at the UN. The United States weighed in and put pressure on countries that had just become independent but were still really colonies, Liberia, Haiti, the Philippines, Thailand, all of whom were opposed to this resolution. But the United States could assert, exert such pressure on them that they voted for it. Once the fighting broke out, which happened immediately the day after this, the, the UN partition, um, in short order, the United States began cha thinking differently about this because they were, at the time, uh, they didn't see Israel as an asset. Uh, they, and at the time, they were thinking uh, that, you know, they, their support for the state of Israel could get some governments in the region overthrown uh, because the, uh, the, the masses of Arab people were, uh, uh, you know, a very much outraged and, and opposed to the creation of a new settler state just at the time when the world is beginning, really, the process of decolonization. So the U.S. kind of went back and forth for a number of years uh, and wasn't the big supporter officially of the state of Israel in those early years. The first country, and, and uh, the state of Israel was seeking, uh, after it was formed uh, and came into being in 1948, uh, an arms deal. And it's an interesting uh, story that one of the, the, the first big arms supplier to the state of Israel was France in the early 1950s. And then Israel, France, and Britain uh, entered into a conspiracy, a real conspiracy, uh, one that didn't stay secret very long, and they conspired together to attack Egypt in 1956. And uh, there's, a, there's a myth that's been widely circulated that Israel is seeking peace but can't find a partner for peace. This is repeated over and over again. But from the very beginning, what Israel was really seeking was uh, to expand its territory. So they, uh, together those three countries launched a war against Egypt in 1956 after the government, the new government of Egypt, nationalized the Suez Canal. But on the eve of the war, the Israelis proposed to their fellow conspirators in the British and French governments that once the war was over, uh, the British would get back the Suez Canal, the French would get rid of Nasser, and, uh, who they thought was key to supporting the revolution then going on in Algeria, and Israel, uh, and this is what Ben Guri and the Prime Minister proposed, would get not only the West Bank, uh, or, but the East Bank of the Jordan River and that part of Jordan, and the rest of Jordan would be uh, become part of Iraq, which was still a British colony. This was his proposal. Uh, on the condition that Iraq would accept all the Palestinian refugees who had been expelled from Palestine to make way for the creation of the State of Israel. Three quarters of the Palestinian population had been expelled in 1948. And that Israel would also get the southern part of Lebanon up to the Litani River and the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, well, they didn't get that. And they, and they uh, were told by the British and French, you'll just have to settle for the Sinai Peninsula down to the Gulf of Aqaba, which is a big piece of territory. But the United States intervened and refused to let this stand. And the United States told, the, uh, and so did the Soviet Union, which had a, a treaty with Egypt. The Soviet Union said to the British and French governments, how would you like rockets coming down in London and Paris? To their surprise, the United States said, yeah, that could happen because unless you get out right now, we're going to withdraw our shield over you. And they told Israel, if you don't get out, we'll get you kicked out of the United Nations. You'll be completely alone in the world and you'll be finished as a state. So they all had to do this, and why did the United States do it? Did they have, were they having a humane moment in the Truman, I mean, in the Eisenhower administration? No, it was the announcement that the, the, the old day was over, the old times were over, the time of the British and French domination was over, and Israel shouldn't be acting as their pawn. Eleven years later, Israel, with the full approval of the United States, conquered the West Bank, Gaza, the Sinai Peninsula, and the Golan Heights. And it was at that time, following the 1967 war, that Israel, the U.S.-Israeli relationship as we know it up until today came into being, where vast amounts of aid began arriving, not counted in millions of dollars, but in the billions of dollars, where the United States built up Israel to be the fourth or fifth most powerful military as an adjunct to U.S. military power in the region. And so for the last approximately 40 years, uh, the relationship that we know of today uh, uh, has existed.
1967, that was also during the conflict when uh, Israel uh, attacked the USS Liberty, is that right? Yeah, it was in that war, the 67 war, and, and there's a great myth about that, myths about that, and I talk about it in the book. Um, I cite the, the leaders, the Israeli leaders, you know, because in, in 1967, it was presented to people here that this was, uh, Israel was about to be annihilated by the power of the Arab, uh, the Egyptian and Syrian armies, and so they acted in self-defense, but I cite three of the leaders of the time, not, who didn't say this at the time, but they said it 10 years, 15 years, 20 years later, oh yeah, we made that up. We made that story up. Uh, and uh, in that war, uh, there was the Israeli uh, uh, fighter bomber attack on a U.S. intelligence ship called the USS Liberty. Uh, and we don't really know. I mean, I think that the, the, uh, the best argument probably is that the, uh, the Liberty had, had uh, which was an intelligence uh, ship, had detected information that the Israeli government did not want to have revealed to the world. I mean, it's uh, very, uh, too often the relationship between states, even allied states, is uh, the way it's presented is, is is in too simplistic a form. Like if you're allies, you're all on the same page about everything. Well, that's not true. And any study of uh, uh, real coalition politics, whether they're civilian coalition politics or military coalition politics, uh, you, you can see that the, the coalitions always have stresses and strains, internal stresses and strains within them, and conflicts of interest within them. And that has certainly been true and is true today in terms of the Israeli-U.S. relationship. So that was, uh, the Liberty is a, is a famous incident in that. Following that war, though, uh, which made the U.S. leadership very happy, I quoted Gerald Ford. He was then the House Minority Leader. He said, Israel's done a great job for us in attacking Egypt and Syria. The aim of the U.S. policy, uh, and that is true down till today, is to uh, defeat and destroy any independent regimes in the region and defeat and destroy any popular movements in the region. That's really the basis of, uh, of the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Uh, but in the aftermath of the war is when, that rela as I was saying, that, that relationship really came into being. And when Nixon was elected in 1968, came into office in 69, he initiated the Nixon Doctrine. The Nixon, and, and this is very interesting because Nixon was, is, is quite well known, a virulent anti-Semite. Uh, but he's, it's under his administration that the aid turns into the billions. And the Nixon doctrine said that Israel and Iran, where the U.S. had put the Shah back on the throne a few years earlier, 15 years earlier, should become the patrol, the patrol officers for U.S. interests in the Middle East because the U.S. was so tied down in Vietnam. Well, with that, we're unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thanks for having me.